Thorsten Mangner, he's an agile consultant and co-founder of Inoxio, a consultancy dedicated to agile practices and software quality. Pull that from your homepage. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he talks about writing acceptance tests in Clojure, and he tries to, uh, or he will explain us how to formulate intent in our acceptance tests. Correct. Yeah and be, uh, get them easy to reason, uh, reason about. So please welcome Thorsten Mangner. Hello, Closureians. I'm Thorsten. Um, I'm a tester. A tester on a developer conference, but... And I've tested um, Closure software for the last couple of years now. And what should I say? I love it, right? It's the best thing that happened to my professional career since, I don't know, the Commodore 64 came out. <laughs> but I have a confession to make. Even though I consider myself an experienced tester, I think that writing integration tests and acceptance tests suck. I find them, I find them hard to write. I find them hard to read, and the combination of both is true. It's even harder to write tests that aren't hard to read. What do I mean by that? Um, hard, why, why hard? Hard compared to what? Hard compared to unit tests, obviously, right? Unit tests are simple, unit tests are elegant, and beautiful, they are easy to write, easy to read, and I don't know if you all know, but we are living in a wonderful land. In the wonderful land of functional programming. Right? And I thank God for giving us closure. And by God, I mean Richicky. <laughs> what could be easier than writing a unit test for a pure function? Right? It's just arguments, a result, and a simple validation. Input, execution, assertion. Simple. Everything else must seem complicated against there. And so do integration tests. Integration tests don't have the luxury of testing pure things, testing functions. They have to test modules, components, services, whole applications. And you see by integration tests, I mean basically everything above unit tests. Everything that integrates more than a couple of functions is an integration test. Right? And those tests have to cope with more complex stuff. And that complexity basically comes from one thing, which is state. Um, those tests have to cope with, with state. They, have, they tend to have state, like not only one state, but state everywhere. There, there, and there, on the file system, in a database, in a third-party service, in the network, or the time itself, right? But as reasonably good closure we are able to manage that complexity. We can handle that, right? We, we mock some things, we prepare a database, stuff like that. And we somehow get our integration test to, to work. It's, it's green, it's stable, and it's fine. But when we look at our test, then we might think or get a feeling, I don't know, it's a lot of stuff, right? And this is maybe not a good test. But what is a good test? A good test has many definitions, like speed, stability, or maintainability. But I want to focus on a not so common thing. How well does my test document my system? This is one of the things that a test should do, right? Document your system. It should act as a living and executable documentation. We know that tests are written once and multiple, and read multiple times, right? 
And the quote from Martin Fowler is quite, quite nice. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers can write code then that humans can understand. And all, this, all that stuff is about communication of intent. For integration tests, the chances are pretty high that they are act as some kind of business relevant, that, that, that they test some kind of business relevant behavior, that they act as a acceptance test, that they test an actual feature with requirements, right? And for those sorts of tests, it's essential to, commu to communicate their intent well. What do I want the system under test to do? And how do I want the system under test to behave like? OK, let's look at some real code. This is based on actual integration tests from a project I currently work on. I stripped it down to barely fit the screen. It's a small font, I know, but it's a lot. Um, I, had, I had it to shrink to actually um, fit on the screen, so it was even more complex than that, but it's complex enough to illustrate my point. The question, is this a good test, and what is the intent? Does this thing tell me what the software should do? I could try to, to get it, right? There's um, a application, application, application starting up, then there's some mocking, and then there's a response, a request with a response, and the response is a JSON document that's suited around here. So is this, is this the intent? An application should be starting up, should take an HTTP request, and a JSON, docu a JSON document is returned? You can always ask yourself the question, what would my project owner say about the software? Would he say, hey, Build me an application that takes in an HTTP request and returns a JSON document. Probably not, right? My project owner would say something like this. There are long-term and short-term recommendations. They all should be sorted by score. And by the way, short-term scores are valued more by some factor or so. So I challenged myself. Could one write a integration test that sucks less? Is it possible to write integration tests that almost look and feel like unit tests? Because unit tests are simple and elegant and beautiful, right? Can you write a test that communicates its intent better than the last example? Of course we can, right? Let's try that. Let's improve the test we just saw with just a handful of simple steps um, to transform the test that does not communicate its intent to something better. This is our starting point. Same test as we just saw. There's a lot, a lot of technical stuff going on in, in the top, right? There's um, redefinition of functions, also mocking of Mongo requests, and a Redis database is prepared with statements, stuff like this. These are not business relevant things. They are just there to prepare the system, right? These should go somewhere else. We will do a simple extract function refactoring. And we do this because we want to separate what from how. Every test case should tell what has to be done, but not how it's done. I don't care how those recommendations are made available to the system. I just want to assume that they are available, right? This will be the test after the transformation. Two new, or th those um, redefinitions and pre database preparation steps are now here, with assume long-term recos are available and assume short-term recos are available. What we've done is separate what from how. Let's imagine a different example. A web page with where every, everything you do, you have to log in first. And you should write tests. So each and every test would have like six steps at the beginning that would say, click on login, click on the user field, enter a username, click on a password field, enter a valid password, click OK, and wait for a confirmation. It would be quite obvious to extract that out of every test, like, and name it in a function like user is logged in. Right? You would just um, reduce the replication, the duplication of the code, right? And 
but we also separating what from how. What do we want in a test is the user is logged in. How we do that? By clicking to, through that user login form. The good thing is, once we separated that what from how, we have plenty of options for the how part. We don't have to click through, through the login form in that, um, on that page. We maybe are able to set a simple cookie to let the user be logged in, right? So we can change the, the, that step without changing the test itself. In our case, it's not important how those long-term and short-term recourse are made available by mocking a database connection or by preparing an actual database. We can decide stuff later. And being able to decide stuff later is always a good thing, right? So those tests will now hold a certain truth. They will tell me, OK, that test only works if long-term and short-term recourse are there. It's not important that. Um, database connections are mocked, but recommendations should be there. That's, that's the important thing. There's still a lot of stuff going on um, at the top of the test with technical stuff like application startup and mocking or making a request to the system. This is part of almost every integration test. Um, prepare a thing start a thing and query a thing. Those things can be extracted too into something more, more simpler, like a simple function that says, hey, just get me the recommendations for, from the application for customer one. Right? So now in our test case, we only have those, we have removed all the clutter, all the technical details, and we just say, hey, assume recommendations are there and get me somehow the recommendations for customer one. We made progress. This is much better than the last example. You see that the font size is slightly increased. Um, but we also lost something on our way. If you read that test, possibly after it failed, you have no idea where those um, articles coming from, right? They are not mentioned anywhere else in the test. So we may take uh, took a step too far, we have hidden business-related informations while hiding technical details in the beginning. So let's fix that. We will make the connection between inputs and outputs obvious. We try to tell a story in our test, right? And every story needs a why. Why is something happening? In our case, why is the response like it is? It is like it is because of the recommendations that are available to the system. So we modify the functions that we extracted earlier to better reflect that why. There are not random recommendations available to the system, but specific ones, right? So we change that part up here. Not assume some long-term records, but some for customer one with article A1 and B2 and same for the short-term recommendations. S simple change. But now the connection between the inputs and outputs is clear. One can see how the articles in the assertion and in the preparation steps are connected. For article one, it's pretty obvious. If you have article one here, long-term, score 100. Article one, long-term, score 100. Perfect. For article B2, it's not that easy. B2, long-term and short-term, OK, and 130. B2 is in both examples. Those recommendations should be somehow combined, right? So there's B2 in long-term and short-term. OK, model is long-term and short-term. Nice. And score is 90 and 20, which is not 130. So something is not obvious here, right? We can make it even more obvious by using simple calculations. Now, the score here is not 130, but 90 plus 2 times 20. And I find the 90 up here and the 20 up here. And this short-term factor, right? Our PO said short-term recommendations are valued more, right? This is how we can make the connections between our inputs and outputs more obvious. Nice. Good. 
The next thing that hinders this test from being really readable is the assertion itself. There's a lot of stuff going on. The content type is being checked, the status code is being checked, and there is a huge assertion for the whole body of the response. And furthermore, there is this magic meta block up here with, that even has magic numbers in it. <laughs> they are not, they're coming out of nothing, right? And I have an, uh, a small tip for you. Integration test does not mean integrate all the assertions into one test. This would not have happened if you followed a simple rule. Write your assertions first. If you write your assertion first, your test will focus on one thing only. Right? In our example, the data part of the response. Both are the recos that should be combined and sorted. This is what the test is about. It's not about the status code or the content type or that magic number in the meta block. And this is what we get. A nice focused assertion is simply extracted a small function here that just says, give me the response, take the body, pass it to JSON, and give me the data part of that response. A simple one-liner. Nothing else distracts us from, from the actual thing that we want to test here. Nice. <laughs> this is almost perfect. The only thing that is left here is one of the two hard problems in computer science, which is naming things. This thing is na named test one, awesome. And an end-to-end -end test. You know what, what's good about failing end-to-end -end tests? It fails somewhere between this end and this end. You have no idea what, what's going wrong, right? So naming things end-to-end -end tests is kind of suboptimal. We should optimize our tests for when we're needing the most, when, thing, uh, when things break, when tests fail, when we have to troubleshoot. Um, being able to localize a problem quickly when a test fails is worth so much, right? Everyone would agree that having good names for functions and variables and namespaces helps um, understanding a piece of code, right? And this is the same for tests and test names and test descriptions. So let's fix that. Um, Recursive sorting test, I think it's a better thing than end-to-end -end test because it says what's trying to test, the sorting of the recommendations. And as the test description, we just use, it sorts long-term recos, long-term and short-term recos by score, short-term scores are very more. That rings a bell, right? That's the word of our project owner. They have to write words to describe what they want. They have the right level of extraction um, to describe your thing that you're testing, the application, your service, whatever. Use that words. It's that simple. And this is, this is it. We are done. Look at all the white space around the test. I cannot even increase the font size anymore. So this is a nice, concise, and readable test. There are no technical details hindering our view on the essential parts here. And the challenge was to create an integration test that almost looks and feels like a unit test. So what would a unit test for that feature look like? Like this. This is the unit test for the, the thing that actually does the job deep inside our software like a pure function, combined recos, that takes in long-term recos, short-term recos, and that factor. The inputs are up here, and there's a small assertion here. Back to our example, it's pretty much the same thing. So, it seems to be, pos it seems to be possible to write integration tests that look and feel like unit tests that are simple and easy to understand and, and somehow tell us what they try to achieve. This wasn't hard. It was only f four or five simple steps. This was not rocket science. This was rocket science. Have you seen that? 
awesome, right? I started with only a few assumptions, um, which I think make a, make a test better. Simple is better than complex. Obvious is better than ambiguous. And isolated is better than coupled. This is true for every, each and every test you write. Simple as that. OK, we're almost done. Um, we, we just took four simple steps to transform a test that was barely readable and did not in communicate its intent with those four steps, like separating what from how, making connections obvious, writing your assertions first, get it more focused and isolated, and preparing for times when you have to troubleshoot is always good. And now I want you to go home. No, not, not now, but after the conference. Go home and look at your code base. Grab the first integration test you find. Look at it and ask yourself some questions like, is it readable? Is, is there so much technical stuff going on that you cannot see the essential parts? Does that test you're looking at tell you what he wants to do, what it wants to do, or how it does it do something, right? So if you find issues, try to fix them with those four or five simple steps I showed. Try it. I promise you it's worth the effort. You will get a much cleaner test suite afterwards than you had before. This is a test, uh, this is a book um, that helped me understanding the ideas behind what I showed today. It's called 50 Quick Ideas to Improve Your Tests. It's from Goiko Ajic, David Evans, and Tom Roden. I only covered um, a small portion of that 50 ideas, so um, I only can, can recommend to grab a copy of this. It's well worth a read. Those guys are um, very well known in the testing community, so this has quite a foundation. And this was basically it. I was very fast. This was um, what versus how, how to write tests that suck less. I'm Thorsten Magner. I work for Inoxio, which is a small con quality consulting agency. We're always looking for people. You're always looking for new projects, so get in touch if you're interested. I have to say, it was an honor to be on stage in front of such a great community. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thorsten. Yeah. So that was quite quick. Are there questions? Yes, there are. Perfect. Thanks. Um, it was a great talk. I uh, agree with almost all the ideas. And the, the one that I struggled with, um, although I agree with the principle, but I struggle with the practice, is the making the connections between inputs and outputs. And I think that um, the thing that causes that causes me concern about that is that your test begins to look like your implementation after a while. Um, I mean, in, in this example, it was kind of it was simple enough, um, but I think that once you get to something that's a bit more of a, a more complex operation, and you want to show rather than just the outputs, but show the connection between them in the test, mm -hmm. you end up rewriting the implementation of your code of the method, the subject under test in the test itself and then you know you makes you question the value of the test at that case i wonder if you have you know seen that or um, could speak to what at what point you you can make a, di a distinction between the two i've not i've not experienced that basically and i have don't have any idea how to how to change that no i'm sorry Sorry. Fair enough. 
that's maybe a dumb question, but you said that one of the hard problems in computer science is naming. What's the second one? Cache validation. Also, it's a Agreed. famous word, uh, quote from somewhere. On, uh, that, yeah. Yeah, it's known. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I agree also with all the ideas. Uh, sometimes when I write tests, I find that maybe I can't do everything. So have you found that is also sometimes a trade-off between maybe simplicity and uh, making things obvious? Or do you think that you can always achieve all the goals and, and, and optimize for the yeah. thing that you? It's certainly true that it's hard, right? And you have to like balance things. If you isolate all your tests, then you have to start up your application every time, prepare it every time, and you m can make trade-offs. Like, okay, I will do five assertions here because the this, this system is once up, and now I will assert things, right? Because it takes like half a minute to start a system up, so you have to use your Mind, right? <laughs> of course, yeah. It's a more serious one. <laughs> so, yeah, and um, one of the problems that I observed in the wild is that um, there are like two camps um, of people, and one of them say, like, well, you have to write the test description, test scenarios in some document and then implement the test for it. And another one, another camp has an opinion that you don't have to write it somewhere, you just have to write tests that they are readable. And I want, I'm i just, what's your mind on that? I mean, what, what do you think about this camp? Mm -hmm. Good question. If you have your test scenarios in one document and then like transform it manually into something else, you will lose things and the old document gets stale and old immediately. Like you change the, uh, only the code and then the, the test document doesn't reflect what's actually in the code. And you lose, you lose that living documentation thing because living documentation is nice. You can al always execute the thing and says it's green. It's exactly how it's described in that code, right? You cannot do that with the documents in Jira or Confluence or wherever they are, right? So you lose that. If you use something like Cucumber, you get that automatic transformation between those written words and your execution layer, which could help in that situation. But you have to be sure that you want to go that way because it's a lot of effort. It has to be clear. Hi, uh, great presentation, thank you. Thank you. Uh, notice that you used the, um, in the earlier examples, you used with three devs and uh, you mock the database and things like that. Do you feel that the, uh, that your tests are testing the actual integration of the applications with the database and what's the, or the, uh, you're just testing that your mocks work? This is, this is again a, a thing you have to balance and you have to make trade-offs. If you call your tests end-to-end -end tests, the, the, the good thing is you can define the ends. <laughs> like, it's, it ends before the database, right? Then you're fine. <laughs> and you can mock the database connection itself. That test we, we saw here was not about how to get things from the database or into the database. It was about the sorting part of the application. So it doesn't matter if I go to the actual database or not, right? There should be a test somewhere else that makes sure that the things involved in that test actually can talk to a real database. But that's kind of a lower test, some, not unit test, right? But that only tests your, your interface to the database with an actual database. And then you make sure in integration tests that it, all the things work until that point. Is that <coughs> Roughly, you have to make trade-offs all the time, right? You, if there are third-party services um, you're you're talking to, you may not able to use them all the time in your tests. So you you have to use mocks then, and, and it 
sometimes it's true for your database too. So you have to balance that. Do you want to go to lunch? Uh -huh. Wait a second, you'll get fed soon. Food is less important. Uh, so um, I saw that in order to make the tests as aesthetically pleasing as you made them in your presentation, you basically have to write quite a lot of plumbing, quite a lot of sort of like mini libraries for for the specific thing that you're testing. So for any example, you had assume short or mm -hmm. short term recommendations, which I assume is some function that does some plumbing in the background, which would mean that a lot of people... Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, this is an example. Mm -hmm. This would mean that a lot of people would basically need for their system to, to write sort of like small libraries that are meant for plumbing test, which I would believe would lead to a lot of overhead once sort of new uh, requirements come in, which would mean, well, I have to change my library because otherwise it won't be as aesthetically pleasing as previously. So how would you cope with that? Okay. So it's not a library. It's just like we basically extracted four things, which are one one-liner and two two-liners. So they stay in the same names as the test. They go ne nowhere else. So that, that's the overhead we are willing to take to make the test cleaner. And once something changes in our system, two things can happen. Either it's a feature change, so we have to change the test, or it's only a refactoring, and we have to change the other part. Not in a test, because the test will still hold true, whatever you do. Right? So only if you change the feature itself, you have to change the test. If you ch change technical implementation stuff, you will change those extracted little pieces. So that, that works quite well. So that's it. Food is ready. Nice. Stop run, uh, start running. And see you later after lunch. <laughs>